Thank you, Mr. Wiedemann. Hello, everyone. I'm Allison Yun, as you guys probably know by now. And as you can probably tell by the piano on stage, I'm going to be performing for you guys today. This won't just be a music performance, though. I'm also going to talk about some classical composers that you might not know. A composer is somebody who writes music. All right, now imagine if we took the top 100 movies of today and decided to watch only those movies and nothing else for the next 300 years. <laughs> Obviously, they'd be great works of art, but it would be a really limited selection. This is essentially what we're doing with classical music right now. Historian Bruce Haynes describes this phenomenon in his book titled The End of Early Music. He calls it the classical music canon. The word canon is defined as the list of works considered to be permanently established as being of the highest quality. When you think of literary classics, authors like Homer, Shakespeare, Dickens, or Tolstoy come to mind. This is the literary canon. When you think of classical music, composers like Beethoven, Bach, Mozart, Chopin come to mind. This is the classical music canon. In music, we've been focusing on a select number of works from the canon and playing them over and over again. These works form the foundations of classical music, so it's very important that us musicians understand them well. After studying piano for the past 12 years of my life, I've come to rely on the classical music canon as a way to guide my piano journey. So what inspired this project? Well, the classical music canon is wonderful, but it also happens to be demographically exclusive. To be blunt, it primarily highlights a white male Western perspective. Last year at the Summer Music Intensive at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia, my teacher, Michelle Kahn, taught me about Florence Price. Florence Price was an accomplished African-American female classical composer in the 1900s. I'd never heard of her before, but I really wanted to learn more. That was the launching point to start an independent study right here at Chadwick. In researching Price, I also realized that there are lots of classical composers in music history from diverse backgrounds but we don't know about them because their works haven't been canonized. Since then, my mission has become pursuing ethical musicianship. What does that mean? Well, I define ethical as doing the right thing even when no one's watching, even when there are no consequences. So in terms of musicianship, it's not necessarily wrong to perform music from our past without looking at other perspectives. I mean, that's what we do anyways. But the ethical choice is to incorporate diversity into my repertoire and give composers like Florence Price due attention and respect. Now I want to apply the principles that I've learned here at Chadwick. Think, do, lead. So I've combined two of my passions music, and cultural activism. For the action step of my research, I'm so excited to share the music and stories of four African-American female classical composers with you today. This is my way of honoring the forgotten voices of our past and raising awareness to work towards meaningful change.
is the first line from Florence Price's Sonata in E minor. It was this melody that first had me hooked on the piece. Florence Price was born in Arkansas in 1887. She studied music at the New England Conservatory, but she had to pretend that she was Mexican and not black in order to attend. Later, she moved back to Arkansas with her family, but after a series of racially motivated hate crimes, like lynching, near her home in the Jim Crow South, she moved up to Chicago during the Great Migration of the early 1920s. In Chicago, her musical talents were recognized. Her symphony in E minor was performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra at the World's Fair in 1932, becoming the first composition by an African-American woman to be performed by a major orchestra. For the rest of her life, Price continued to teach and compose. She was a pioneer for composers of color and women composers, accomplishing an unprecedented feat. I think that Price brings a unique artistic perspective to the classical music world because of her identity. Sometimes we make music impersonal and we forget about the people behind the notes. I believe that music can be enjoyed in a vacuum as a collocation of sounds. But I believe that music is enriched with context when we know who the composer was and when and why they wrote what they did. Even though she lived and died nearly a hundred years ago, Price continues to teach musicians like me. I was drawn to her sonata because it feels familiar, but also unique. I found the main refrain, which you heard earlier, so simple, but so attractive. It comes up 11 times. Try to identify each time that it recurs. The piece is broken into three sections, a beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning is calm and nostalgic but then it develops urgency in the middle as the rhythm and the volume intensify to a climax. Then the climax slips back into a recap, becoming shimmery and dreamy and magical. And you'll hear the main melody one more time. Hopefully this helps to guide your listening. Now, please enjoy Sonata in E minor, second movement by Florence Price.
up, we have Dorothy Rudd Moore. Dorothy Rudd Moore was born in Delaware in 1940. She studied composition at Howard University, then later studied under legendary French conductor, pianist, and music teacher Nadia Boulanger in France. Like Price, more faced racial hardships. She recalls that she and her husband, a cellist, were almost prevented from performing in the 1969 Damrosch Memorial Concert because the organizers didn't want to have black performers on their program. In 1968, Moore co-founded the Society of Black Composers in New York to celebrate the work of other black composers and to educate her community. In 1985, her opera, Frederick Douglass, inspired by the historical abolitionist, premiered in New York. The piece that I will be playing, A Little Whimsy, first caught my attention because of the interesting title. Moore allegedly wrote this piece in response to a critic who claimed that her music was too serious. I love how Moore conveys humor, sarcasm, and whimsy here, which are emotions that we don't often associate with classical music. It's a short solo piece that uses avant-garde techniques like atonality, bitonality, polytonality, and modal scales. So essentially, it sounds clangy, but on purpose. Listen as it switches back and forth between dissonance, clangy sounds, and consonance, pleasant sounds. I've played contemporary pieces in the past, and they've always been a fun challenge for me as a musician. How can I turn something that sounds random into something that sounds structured, <clears throat> intentional, and accessible to the listener? I have to search beneath the surface to find the piece's true beauty, and I can't rely on an expressive melody line to engage my audience. With that, please enjoy A Little Whimsy by Dorothy Rudd Moore. Thank you. 
Next up, we have Valerie Capers. Valerie Capers was born in New York City in 1935. She experienced a major tragedy early on when she lost her eyesight at the age of six, becoming legally blind. But that didn't stop her from becoming an accomplished musician. As a pianist, Capers had to read and memorize all of her pieces in Braille because she couldn't read music the traditional way. Her hard work paid off though, and she earned her bachelor's and master's degrees at Juilliard, becoming the Institute's first blind graduate. Her biggest work is an operatorio called Sojourner, about the life of historical African-American abolitionist and women's rights activist, Sojourner Truth. However, her most popular composition is a simple 12 work series called Portraits in Jazz. Portraits is meant to be a bridge between the jazz music and classical music worlds. It's a beginner's jazz album written specifically for classically trained pianists, which invites people like me to try something new and go outside my comfort zone. The piece that I'll be playing today is called Billy's Song. It's part of Portraits in Jazz, and it's inspired by mid 20th century African American jazz swing singer, Billy Holiday. I chose to perform this piece not only because of the beautiful harmonies, but also because it includes my very own embellishments. In past eras, classical musicians had to master both reading and writing music, but nowadays most classical musicians are only expected to play what's written on a page. I'm used to memorizing notes and not coming up with my own. This piece encouraged me to dip my toe into the world of basic improvisation. As I play the piece, I'll play it once as written and once my own way. Try to listen for the things that I've changed. Please enjoy Billy's Song by Valerie Capers.
have Margaret Bonds. Margaret Bonds was born in Chicago in 1913. Her parents were early civil rights activists, and they were a huge inspiration to her. She studied music with Florence Price when she was younger, then later attended Northwestern University to earn degrees in piano and composition. As one of the few black students there, she struggled with isolation and racism, but she found solace in the poetry of Langston Hughes, someone who she became very close friends with later in life. Bonds attended Juilliard as well. As an adult, Bonds became a teacher in Chicago, New York City, and Los Angeles. And she focused on teaching music specifically in inner city communities. She founded the Margaret Bonds Chamber Society where black musicians could perform music by black composers. She also composed a large-scale classical work called Ballad of the Brown King, which combines elements from various Black musical traditions, including jazz, blues, calypso, and spirituals. Bond's musical journey was closely linked to activism. During the 1950s and 60s civil rights movement, Bonds used her musical talents to actively uplift black excellence. Bonds was an ethical musician to the core, very cognizant of which voices and messages she chose to represent through her work. This piece caught my attention because I recognized the theme from our very own Jubilee Gospel Choir. It's based on the famous African-American spiritual, Wade in the Water. Wade in the Water was a secret code used on the Underground Railroad, warning refugee slaves to get off of the trail and into a body of water so they wouldn't leave a scent that could be followed by slave catchers' dogs. You might recognize the melody. It goes like this. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Listen, listen to how Bonds creatively develops this simple refrain. Especially noticeable is the way she uses an offbeat rhythm to add intensity, which is called syncopation. The composition is interesting to me because it portrays a spiritual through the medium of classical piano, demonstrating that Bonds subverts and upends the high art, low art stereotype. With that, please enjoy Troubled Waters by Margaret Bonds.
compositions are only given life when they're performed and shared. After all, notes on a piece of paper are no more enjoyable than a list of ingredients on a recipe. These pieces have been relatively unknown since they aren't part of the classical music canon. But I hope this performance celebrating forgotten works fulfilled the composer's vision and expanded your understanding of classical music as well. We all want to change the world for the better, and it seems like an impossible task because we don't know where to start. But as we look for and discover hidden parts of our past, we open up opportunities to explore, experiment, and eventually make a difference. This principle doesn't just apply to classical music. I encourage everyone listening to take the things you're passionate about and look at them from another angle. Which voices are most prominent? Are there certain patterns? To gain a richer and more diverse understanding of your passion, you might consider diving into your very own research. Find those forgotten voices in your world and join me in becoming ethical thinkers. Let's take on that responsibility together and see where it leads us. Thank you so much for joining me today.